I know that the principle of fallibility and reflexivity is against making predictions. So I'll try to make a prediction anyway. And my prediction is that everybody who is interested in the thinking of George Soros should come back to these lectures. I do believe this was uh, one of the most intensive type of rethinking your own philosophy for the last 20 years. And nothing is done more than on the concept of open society. I have been rereading yesterday the book, Opening the Soviet System, that he have been basically wrote 20 years ago. And then the situation looks slightly more clear. You have the open society. By the way, the open society, and this is very much according to also Popper, was based on the idea of a democracy inhabited by a scientists, critically thinking people in a very critical mode, which experimenting with the idea and not being afraid of failing. And of course, this type of a confrontation between open society and closed society was a formative experience for our generation. I do believe we're going to a much more difficult period in which Karl Popper met Karl Rove. And the problem of a simple dichotomy between open society and closed society is not as useful as it was. So as a result of it, I'm very grateful to George Soros for making this uh, type of talk. And I just want to make three points and ask two questions. The first point is very much about this manipulative function. Popper himself, at the end of his life, became obsessed with television. All his latest interviews have been attacked on television. But he never went to attack his concept because it is not about television, this is about liberal rationalism. How rational it could be, it's very much the Enlightenment fallacy, and he basically decided to stay with it. I do believe that what uh, uh, Mr. Soros has done today, first of all, is much more intellectually honest. Being between two fallacies, the Enlightenment fallacy and the postmodern fallacy, this is the problem of a moral and tragic choice where you stand. Nobody can simply say one is fallacy and the other is not a fallacy, but you need a kind of a religion of your own. And this tragic nature of modern liberalism, in my view, is something to be stressed against a very naive type of uh, things which basically believe that uh, liberalism is uh, natural and uh, self-obvious and nothing to be done. The second problem is all these arguments which are coming with the postmodern fallacy are not new ones. If you go back to history, Plato's criticism of democracy is very much about the rule of the sophists, people who are not interested in truth, who simply try to persuade the others. And honestly speaking, it's much easier to talk truth to power than to talk truth to the voters. And from this point of view, rethinking electoral democracy in terms of open society, I see as the major challenge. And from this point of view, this lecture is very different from many things that we have heard uh, before. But if this is the case, I have three questions. The first has a lot to do with the problem of politics, and I mean government. Comparing your lecture from yesterday and your lecture today, yesterday you put much more trust in government, in regulating economy. Now when we know how much the manipulative function have taken precedence in politics, how sure you are that the government is going to fulfill the function that you subscribe to this when it comes to the economy. And second is when we know now that it's not only the cognitive function, but this is also the manipulative function. Are you in a mood to rethink the way you have been supporting education or the way you're working with media in your foundations, because basically part of the supremacy of the education was also part of the Enlightenment view of the world. It was enough to educate the people, to inform them. The informed citizen was the ideal. Now, the citizen can be informed, but he can be uninformed in a very manipulative way. So in a certain way, I do believe that you're coming to a radical moment in which we're so much used to take democracy and open society for granted that it takes your talk to start asking questions which is so old that we have forgotten the answers. Thank you very much. I won't comment. You can open it up. You can yeah. open it up. Yeah. So, but this was, I do believe also, there are going to be a much more important questions that are going to come from the audience. Like yesterday, we're going to give the precedence to New York and to the Columbia University 
students who are there. So they're going to have the first three questions, please. I'm the Senior Associate Dean here at Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. And I'd like to thank you first for including us in this teleconference. It's an honor for us to be involved. And thank you on behalf of Dean John Coatsworth. We have a number of students who have interesting questions prepared for you. I'd like to invite them to come up to the podium and join me and to introduce themselves as they present their questions. The first student who I'd like to ask to come to the podium is Ms. Zhou. Please join me here. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Soros. My name is Silian Zhou. I'm a first year student at Columbia uh, University School of International Public Affairs. I was born in Beijing, and um, I read your theory about uh, reflexivity before. I have a, a two quick questions for you. Um, first one is, um, you mentioned the term, the pursuit of knowledge, which I agree that it takes willingness and, um, in my opinion, tremendous commitment. But more importantly, I think it takes significant resources too. For example, I need to pay for Columbia to, to listen to your lecture today. And, um, but for the majority of the population, people don't have enough resources, especially economic resources, uh, to pursue the reality. Thus, that's why a political machine has room to mani mani manipulate, sorry. So in your opinion, is there any solution to this problem, for example, by, devo by devoting more resources, perhaps more than the man manipulative power spends to promote the open society? So there was a very interesting question yeah, coming, yeah. yeah. So probably we should answer question by question because yeah. she's, yeah, she's very much interested when you don't have an access to education and cannot get knowledge, how you can defend yourself yeah. from the manipulative uh, uh, power of the government and how you see the solution of this. Yeah. Well, o obviously uh, education uh, is very, education of the electorate is very important in a, a developing an open society and, uh, and uh, access to education is an important requirement. Uh, uh, and basically, uh, uh, many countries accept, uh, m most developed uh, countries accept th that responsibility. In, in, in recent years, there's been an increasing tendency to charge uh, fees, uh, this is in uh, in, in Europe, uh, and uh, but only at the at the at the university uh, level, and I think that there ought to be. Uh, I mean, you could argue that people who get a university education uh, get a, uh, a leg up in the world that it's proven that their uh, income afterwards is, is uh, substantially higher than others. So uh, uh, maybe they ought to pay for that privilege, but maybe they ought to pay for it later. So, uh, so um, uh, in, in a way in America, uh, you, you have uh, uh, universities that give scholarships and, and uh, but collect uh, from alumni, and I think that's a very good system, actually. Uh, um, uh, so uh, I'm all in favor of, 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 of uh, uh, making education more widely, widely available, uh, but it may be appropriate for, uh, for you know, to have student loans available. That has been abused in America. Uh, so it is, a, it, is a, it is an issue. How can one provide the, the, the best educational opportunities, equality of opportunity in education? Thank you very much. You have a second question? Yes. And uh, my second question has something to do with China. So when it comes to China, the culture of this country emphasized central authority since more than 2,500 years ago. Um, and so far, it seems to have limited impact on its economic growth and equality of foreign policies. So my question is, in the long run, 
do you think the clash between manipula manipulative power and the public awareness of reality will influence China and the structure of the world? It, it, it's a very good question about China. Years ago, it was going to be a question about Russia, too. And it was about the political culture. And to a certain extent, where political culture is going to stay in your definition of the open society? Because the question here was, where do you see the trend? Is China is going to overcome this culture of a centralized government and very much, much more obedient relations to power? Yes. Yeah. No, I mean, you're, you're, you're absolutely right that the history of, of China is an imperial history with the ruler having a lot of power and, and the, the subjects uh, being subjected to uh, various kinds of uh, rules, uh, uh, some more harsh than others. Uh, and it is to be hoped that China will develop into a more open society as it, as it gains a power and influence in, in, the, in the world. Uh, because uh, I think that uh, there is in China a great uh, desire and need for stability. It's because of the history of, of China. People are very concerned about maintaining stability. Um, and that, of course, uh, relies on the uh, state uh, uh, power. So uh, China today cannot yet be considered an open society. Uh, but as China becomes a, 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 an influential great power in the world, and it needs to be accepted by the rest of the world. And, uh, and the, the Chinese leadership will have to pay more attention to what the rest of the world thinks about China, because that is the way for China to, to rise and become more influential. Thank you very much for your questions. Probably two more questions from Columbia, from New York. Uh, good morning and uh, good evening for you. Uh, thank you very much for your lecture. It was very interesting. My name is Alexander Ilchuk, and I'm a graduate student of School of International Affairs here at Columbia. I'm from Ukraine. And I have a question. Uh, how uh, do you see the way a society can evolve into avoiding manipulative mode of government? And what is the role of intellectual elites in that process? How do you see this? The question was, what is the role of the intellectual elites to prevent this rise of manipulative governments? And this is a question of somebody who comes from Ukraine, so he knows what he speaks about. Yeah, I, 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 I think your question is very, very relevant, because I, I, I firmly believe that an open society does need an intellectual elite. Uh, and that is not a very popular uh, um, uh, idea today, uh, because everything is tends towards egalitarianism, uh, and I think that is the, that is actually uh, uh, dangerous uh, for an open society, because you have one person, one vote, right? But the, the educational level, the level of understanding, seriousness, etc., of different people is not not the same, and therefore. There, there needs to be well-informed people, people who are concerned with, with, the, with, the, with the public interest, who take more interest, express their views, and their views gain some respect. Uh, in, in, in England, uh, basically democracy developed uh, under the uh, careful uh, guide, uh, guidance and of the aristocracy, uh, people who, who held themselves to pretty high standards uh, and, and so on. Um, and they had also the leisure to, to be concerned with public uh, affairs. Um, and uh, I think we need more of that uh, because these issues are not that easy to understand. 
And, and uh, if, if uh, now, with the various uh, uh, methods of, uh, of uh, well, of, of uh, reaching the broad public, uh, the intellectuals, the elite, is more concerned with manipulating, reducing messages to a level where it gets a lot of traction. So uh, the elite has to have a, a, a commitment to the pursuit of truth. And then it has to have influence in the, in the general public. I think that is, those are the conditions that you actually need for a flourishing open society. Thank you very much. And one more question from New York. After that, we're going to come to Budapest and probably we'll go back to New York later. Uh, oh, hi, I'm, I'm Matthew Flagg. I'm a second year PhD student in the economics department. Um, Mr. Soros, you mentioned that in order for an open society to function, the, the cognitive function of our thinking must take uh, precedence over the manipulative function. But as we've discussed, those who espouse the manipulative function seem dedicated to the end of suppressing the objective reality. Uh, in your view, uh, beyond the role of education, as we've already discussed, is it an achievable goal to have the majority of people in a society dedicated to the pursuit of truth? And uh, if so, uh, how can we go about achieving this goal in the face of opposition to the truth from the manipulators? Do you believe perhaps that the media could, could play a role in this and uh, how could they go about uh, doing this? Yeah, yeah, media. No, uh, Puato is going to be, I do believe, uh, happy to listen to this question because the question was, do you expect that they're going to be the majority of the truth seekers in society? And if they're not going to be such a majority beyond education, where you're going to see the solution, what, what should be the role of the media, and basically what is the role of the media? Well, let me take a, a very elitist point of view. And I think that even a very small percentage of the population that is genuinely concerned with the public interest can make a big difference. Uh, because you could see that the uh, competition between the various political views usually bring you very, very close to 50%. Uh, it's an interesting question why that is. But there is a convergence around the 50-50 split, and it's a very, very narrow uh, so, uh, 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 difference that actually uh, wins or loses uh, votes. So if you just have just a few percent that is particularly, let's say, uh, 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 is concerned with the pursuit of truth, uh, it could make a, a, a tremendous difference. Now, the question of, 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 of media is a very, very troubling question because media has two functions. On the one hand, it's an indispensable uh, uh, element in an open society. It has an institutional role. Uh, on the other hand, it's a business. And as a business, it has to cater to the demand. And if there is no demand for serious information, uh, but for entertainment, then the media that is going to be popular and read by a lot of people or listened to by a lot of people is not going to be concerned with serious discussion of affairs. So in the end, it really does come down to the electorate. Thank you very much. We're going to Budapest, but as we heard, there is a good news for you. You don't need a majority of truth stickers you should have them only in the swinging states. So, <laughs> so uh, please, let's go, let's go with the questions uh, from you the past. Please, Mark Donner. Uh, there is a question here. Thank you. Uh, Mark. Thank you. I actually covered the 2004 election as a reporter. 
So in a sense, I'm on both sides of this question, a representative of the media and I hope some kind of truth seeker. Uh, I'm afraid, though, that my verdict, uh, at least from my experience covering that election, is going to be a bit dismaying uh, with, with respect to what you've told us here today. I was struck again and again when I interviewed people uh, at rallies, particularly at rallies for George W. Bush, uh, and I'm talking about educated people, uh, people who read the New York Times every day and so on. The number of times I would be told, for example, that weapons of mass destruction were found in Iraq. Uh, and these, again, were not benighted people. They read the press. Uh, they were perfectly able to read in the press that weapons were not found. But I gradually came to the view that our whole model of how people understand politics very often is wrong. We tend to think of it as a kind of inductive process by which people gather facts and then make a judgment about a political candidate or a policy according to how it conforms to the truth of those facts. And in fact, I found again and again that people would begin with a belief, in this case, a belief in George W. Bush and his leadership, and then they would assemble the facts to accord with that original belief. And when they came to a conflict that was particularly strong, and the fact that weapons of mass destruction having served as the uh, occasion or the reason for the war were then not found. When they came to that kind of strong conflict, they simply rejected it out of hand. Uh, and I saw this and heard this so much, and from people who were, again, educated, had critical faculties of the sort that you've just described, uh, had been to the elite schools in the United States, that it struck me very strongly that um, much of the way we think about how people make decisions about politics may well be wrong. I'm sorry, that's a long way to get to the point of if indeed my conclusion or what I discovered is true, what are the implications for your view of the open society and what's necessary to it? Well, actually, I would be interested in your conclusions from your experience. But I, I do think that at around that time, there was really an, a, an increased uh, disregard for facts in the information that people were getting. And uh, there was a, the, a propaganda machine that was uh, uh, parading as legitimate media. Uh, you know, uh, Fox uh, television, uh, their motto was, uh, uh, what was it, uh, 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 fair and balanced, or something. fair and balanced, which was a, an Orwellian statement. Uh, um, and it, it did actually mislead people, um, because they were getting this information as if it was information, and it was deliberate uh, misstatement of facts. So, and you, it, you had it from politicians that, like, like uh, Vice President Cheney, who had absolutely no hesitation uh, saying things uh, that were actually untrue. So, uh, um, coming from authoritative sources, it, I think it did sway the public. Uh, now, you could say that the public is responsible because they put up with it, uh, and I think they are. But I think that this was a particularly dark period in, 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 uh, in American public discourse. I don't know whether you'd agree with that, but that's, that certainly was, was my impression. Thank you very much. Please. Thank you very much. My question is very simple. Do you believe that the pursuit of truth leads to an education for truth, and this leads for moral values on education? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, not, not, not necessarily. Uh, I personally seem to have this uh, uh, particular quest or, 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 or uh, 
uh, emotional commitment. But, but I think it's easy to have different set of values. And, and um, uh, if you've been reasonably successful um, living a myth uh, that you have created, then there's nothing to stop you from doing it. So it's not that it, that's exactly otherwise. If, if the truth eventually uh, uh, had to convince you, then of course people would be convinced that the problem wouldn't be there. So actually, and particularly uh, since when it comes to uh, natural phenomena, we have learned that uh, you know illusions don't work as well as as uh, as, um, as a proper understanding of the laws of nature you know starting with the alchemists you know who used incantation to try to make uh, uh, gold out of base metals and they, you know they never succeeded human affairs are different you can actually succeed that's the whole point of what makes what why reflexivity makes human affairs so very different. You know, if the alchemists, if they had been active in the financial markets, uh, they would probably be prospering. Uh, because you can actually change reality by incantation. So that's how human affairs are different from natural affairs. And so you don't, uh, the truth doesn't have the same convincing power because it can itself be modified. It can be manipulated. And that's really why we have this problem. Thank you very much. There was two questions there. Please. I was actually uh, very disturbed by this, uh, uh, this idea of manipulative function. Uh, I actually lived through both 2004 and 2008 elections in the U.S. as a foreigner, uh, and my, what, what struck me in your in your um, speech in your lecture was that you did not mention uh, uh, the 2008 campaign and the Obama strategy, which was profoundly manip manipulative by your definition. I mean, it was obviously truth, but it was truth well told. And I think because of the well told element, it was so persuasive. That's why Obama beat uh, Senator Clinton in the primaries and then was uh, so strongly positioned in the general election. If, if you agree that there was an element of charisma and manipulation and selling the truth uh, in, in, in his campaign, then there is a real dilemma, because obviously to change the society away from manipulative state, we need to gain political power, but to do this, we need to join the game of manipulating. And then uh, it is a, a, a moral problem that I would like to know how to explain to my students here. Okay. No, I, I, I would have to... <laughs> I, I really have to differ from you. Uh, because yeah, clearly, uh, Obama had political advisors, and they were telling him what to say and what not to say, and and so on. Uh, but there was a very different attitude that Obama uh, um, expressed, and he treated uh, the electorate as intelligent people and talked to them as intelligent people. Now he wasn't widely heard. But the, the tone and the intention and, and the standards that he applied were really, to me, uh, actually remarkably uh, um, different from the other side. Uh, the difference was in 08 was, was as great as it was in 04. In, in, now, I may be biased, so I, uh, in fact, I am biased. <laughs> Nevertheless, I believe this to be true. 
So, however, of course, <coughs> you, 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 you can't avoid taking into account uh, the fact that uh, uh, people's perceptions can be manipulated. And I think if you, if you disregard it, you have no chance of getting elected. Thank you very much. Before going there, I remember uh, politicians from the communist period on this talk on manipulation who used to say, we are saying the truth, only the truth, but not the whole truth. Okay. So from this point, <laughs> there is a question. <laughs> Hello, Alexander Altunian, uh, uh, Moscow, uh, one of Moscow universities, and now CEU uh, visiting researcher. Um, let me be in kind of uh, advocate for Diego, uh, for Diego. Uh, uh, founding fathers didn't promise person of truth; they just promised person of happiness and uh, freedom. Isn't isn't it enough? Or um, was I wrong? I mean, uh, is, um, it was understandable. I mean, they didn't, they didn't say nothing about person of truth. They said that um, every man, every man could pursue the happiness, and every man is free. So maybe it's enough, or we should just shoot. Uh, pursuing the truth. Yeah, yeah. The, the question was, and of course it's an interesting one, he said when you have been referring to the founding fathers, the founding fathers said nothing about the truth. They were about pursuing of happiness and freedom. Do you need truth in order to be free and happy? This is the question in a way I got it here. I definitely think so. Uh, because because of this, the, um, uh, the importance of understanding reality uh, in order to uh, uh, be able to lead a successful life, you know, uh, um, uh, make an impact on reality the way you uh, 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 get the results that you want as opposed to unintended adverse consequences. So to eliminate, to reduce the adverse consequences, you need to understand. And you need to understand that in the case of human affairs, reality is not a, 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 um, a passive target that you shoot at. It's a moving uh, target. And how people perceive it and how people act changes the reality that you have to deal with. So it's, the reality in human affairs is much more difficult to understand. But nevertheless, you need to understand it in order to narrow the divergence between your intentions and expectations on the one hand and the outcome on the other. That's the same in bo both in uh, dealing with nature and with humanity, but it, but in the case of human affairs, it's much more difficult because it's a moving target. Because reality can, in fact, be manipulated. Thank you very much, Professor Gaspar. Yeah. Uh, uh, George, I I loved your lecture. I would like to make a few comments disagreeing with you, but I had to make a comment about. Uh, our last uh, questioner. The expression happiness in the Declaration of Independence is much closer to the French felicité and really meaning public welfare to a very large extent. So this is not individual happiness, it is liberty and public welfare. And of course public welfare immediately gets us back to the pursuit of truth. And I have really no question uh, that the framers uh, the Founding Fathers were deeply Enlightenment characters per, uh, committed to the pursuit of truth. So, George, I, uh, I, have, uh, uh, a com I have a couple of comments. One is uh, about elections. 
Well, I think elections have been Churchill, democracy is the worst form of government except for all others. Elections have been incredibly problematic for whenever we have had genuine elections, let us say for the last hundred years. And talk about the manipulative function here in Hungary, uh, we just had a rather extreme example recently uh, of that uh, in an election campaign. Never mind, of course, Hitler, etc. So, what the electorate does in response to politicians who, as you said, want to be re-elected or want to get office and who are highly manipulative in many ways is uh, never to be quite known, but I'm a, my, my own experience over the last decades has led me to believe if elections come out the right way, we are very lucky. It is then those few percent you just mentioned. But on the whole, electors are vastly overtaxed uh, in making complex decisions about what the facts are or what the policy, policies should be. Health policy, let us say, or take any such thing. So that gets me to the other side of open society and where I am in complete agreement with you and uh, which I think has for me become vastly more important in a way than elections. I obviously believe we have to have elections and I'm all for them and I vote regularly, uh, but the conditions, freedom of speech, freedom of association, access to media, all of those things that can help us in the pursuit of truth uh, are for me have become over the years much more important uh, uh, really uh, uh, than uh, uh, the electoral process as such, which is also so confined by artificial arrangement, arrangements about majorities and what have you. So it is really the vigor of a civil society not necessarily using the term the way it is fashionable these days, but the vigor of a civil society, that is our only hope. And there, I think, as a matter of fact, the United States comes out very well, because we still have a society where lots and lots of people dig for the facts, pursue the truth, use the Freedom of Information Act, and so on, and, uh, and show the Bush lies for what they were. So, that's it. Okay. It was a comment. No, I, no, we spoke I, I, no. <laughs> I agree with you entirely on the importance of the institutions. And, and, uh, and in fact, elections can often be a detriment to, to uh, the development of those institutions. In some of the countries that I have foundations, uh, uh, take a country like Kazakhstan, there is no way that the ruling uh, uh, group is going to allow another group to take possession of, of, the, of the state when the, there's so much oil there and so much revenue and, and so much is at stake. Uh, so, so actually, elections very often just uh, uh, more or less push the regime into repression uh, uh, when uh, without elections, they might actually be more relaxed. I mean, this is a rather unorthodox view, but uh, I don't think that elections do much good in those countries. So I entirely agree with you. And yet, you, uh, gradually, uh, you could see uh, uh, a country like Kazakhstan, be exactly because it does have uh, uh, natural resources, perhaps develop the institutions that will eventually lead to uh, uh, democratic elections even. Uh, so, uh, uh, but on the other point that you make, uh, that uh, really elections don't matter that much, I think there has been a, a change in America in the structure of, of uh, the political parties because with the two-party system, uh, uh, the dynamics were always for both parties to try to capture the middle in order to gain a majority. And then about uh, roughly 25 years ago, a little lo longer than that, 30 odd years ago, uh, the, the Republican Party was uh, basically uh, came under the influence 
of uh, people with the fairly extreme views who uh, moved the country further towards their views and did not move towards a compromise uh, position. And then uh, the, the Democrats tried to capture the middle, so they moved more and more towards uh, a certain ideology, I call it market fundamentalism, and, but that's only part of it, because of course in the case of the Bush administration, it had to do with military power and, and et cetera and the, the, uh, the uh, uh, unitary uh, presidency, so the, the presidential power. So at any rate, instead of two parties moving towards the middle, uh, you had one party moving f further and further to the right, whatever that may be, uh, and the other party trying to capture it, and the whole uh, uh, scene, political scene shifted very radically during our lifetime in America. Thank you very and much. And therefore, the elections became more important. Uh, before, you know, so it was one party or the other. It didn't make that much uh, difference. And there were basically certain uh, values as well as institutions. You mentioned the importance of institutions. But I think certain values of, uh, uh, you know, uh, public probity, which may have been hypocritical, but nevertheless, they were the supposed values that were guiding the people. Just to make a comment, probably elections could be a fertile fallacy. Because if you see the elections in places like Ukraine 2005 and others, even elections that are perceived as failing can mobilize public energy. So from this point of view, I do believe that elections really has a problem of their own, but unfortunately I cannot see what is going to replace them for the moment. So please. Hello, I'm Ellen Hume. I'm an Annenberg Fellow at CEU's Center on Media and Communication Studies. You've taken us on quite a journey with your lectures so far. And today in particular, when you were talking about the fate of our political culture, not just in America, but much more broadly, it was a pretty sad, a pretty tragic picture of culture today. And what I'm trying to smoke out is whether you're a pessimist or an optimist. And before you answer, I want to couch it in a little context. I've just returned from two African countries where I've been trying to craft arguments very similar to what your wonderful foundations have done about why governments should allow free press and free speech. And one of the arguments, actually, I heard a little bit of in your talk today, and that was that governments that live by propaganda tend to start believing their own propaganda, and therefore the objective reality comes and gets them in the end. So is there a hope in your mind, or maybe I am too hopeful, that our culture will shift yet again to a more reality-based operation since there is ultimate failure, like death, built into the propaganda machine. No, I'm very hopeful that it will, actually. And I don't think that it's a one-way street of decline, uh, you know, f and, and the past was not as glorious as I may have implied in my speech. I think there were periods of, of, of uh, uh, when things were working very well in certain countries, and then they declined. Uh, I, I was, I've been rather shocked by the decline in America. Um, and that's, uh, that's genuinely, I, I feel that, and, and it was a surprise to me. I think that the whole Bush phenomenon was a shock uh, to me because, you know, I, I came from uh, Hungary, uh, where America was looked up, uh, you know, with a, there's a certain uh, idealistic view of America as being the uh, home of democracy and, 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 and so on. So uh, uh, it was, it was uh, and I think that there is actually uh, uh, something that has gone wrong and needs to be corrected. Uh, I think the, f the, the fact that Obama was elected was a tremendous uh, 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 
change. And yet, I'm troubled that the public opinion hasn't shifted uh, as, uh, as much as the fact that uh, as, as a totally different kind of president was elected. Uh, and the, the political discourse hasn't changed all that much. Uh, so there is, I think, something uh, seriously wrong in America today, but it doesn't mean that the world is going to hell in a basket or that the past was always wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. There is a question there. In Bulgaria, we try to believe that uh, the pessimist is somebody who believes that it cannot be worse, but the optimist knows that it could be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I am from CEU. I am a doctoral uh, student in law, and I am also from Kenya. Um, my question relates to what um, you seem to be um, uh, concluding in terms of. Uh, uh, back to the founding fathers. Um, why I, 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 am, I am a bit troubled with that is because um, much as they were saying about self-evident truths, they belong to a particular class. Uh, their truths did not include the Africans who, are, who they, they still enslaved. Their truth did not include, for, for instance, even women, or I mean, they were, it was specific truths. Um, and yet that is where you kind of fall back. Um, and looking at American society, you would, say, you would say it's an American society. American society has been kind of open. But internally, perhaps, when you look at its foreign policy, there is nothing open about it. It is the one that has been preaching in my country, for instance, that uh, Kenya, about uh, market fundamentalism that you are talking about that has caused a lot of problems. Um, here at CEU, I'm grappling with the question of uh, enforcement of socioeconomic rights. So my question to, to you is, um, how open is this concept to other realities that perhaps um, that there are so many people who could be excluded from a participation because of uh, deprivations and all that, and yet perhaps the main talk I hear is about okay, uh, the free press, uh, free, uh, the civil and political rights. Perhaps neglecting the, I mean, um, uh, the the uh, social economic rights. And I understand, of course, coming from the communist system, uh, communist realities. It's perhaps, uh, uh, I mean, your realities also shape what kind of uh, vision you would have. So that's the question. How open is really the open uh, society that you think you, 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 you are thinking about? Yeah. You see, uh, I, I've been stressing uh, the, uh, the difference between the uh, view of the world and the way the world actually is. And certainly, let's say, uh, America had the view uh, uh, of the world which believed in equality, uh, human rights, uh, individual freedom, and so on. And at the same time, you had slavery uh, at the time of the Founding Fathers. Uh, and when you uh, uh, talk about market fundamentalism, I, I think it is a, a totally false Pretense, you see, this invis the the, uh, the um, uh, invisible hand of the market that the, that uh, uh, provides equal opportunity to all. Well, behind the invisible hand of the of the market, there is the visible hand of politics, and we sets the rules. And and uh, uh, while actually the international system established uh, uh, at Bretton Woods. Uh, and at the United Nations was on the surface uh, uh, a very uh, rule of law kind of uh, uh, um, e sort of equal, e equal treatment for, for each. There's no question that the United States, which basically uh, set the rules, was more equal than the others. And, and it was not immediately obvious, 
but it's very definitely the case. So uh, I have a lot of sympathy with your position. <laughs> Please. Uh, Colin McGinn. Uh, George, I find it interesting and perhaps a little ironic that you uh, today have come around to defending uh, a conception of politics rather like Plato's. I mean, uh, ironic because of your, your being a follower of Popper, who of course was very against Plato. The reason I say this is that you, you're emphasizing today the point that Popper neglected, and you earlier neglected, the influence of propaganda and manipulation in, in politics and, and in democracies today. Of course, that problem was what Plato uh, saw all along was the problem of democracy. It was the problem of the sophists, as you pointed out, manipulators of opinion. As a defense against that problem, Plato advocated an intellectual elite who would be trained in certain ways and would be committed to the truth. He called them the philosopher kings, of course. And they would be protection against the sophists. This is, of course, as anathema to Popper and other liberal democrats because it seems to be give more political power to this elite than to the run of the population. So I wonder whether you'd like to comment on whether you think you've become, unlike Popper, a, a Platonist about politics. Uh, basically, the question was, are you not becoming much more on the Plato side than on the Popper side? Because it was much more Plato who had been pushing for the philosophers to run in order basically to have an elite which can counterbalance the manipulative power of the sophists. Yes, I think, uh, um, uh, I mean, it's well known that Popper was a little too hard on, on Plato to start with. Uh, um, uh, but I, I've actually um, had more trouble with Lee Kuan Yew than with Plato, because, you know, Lee Kuan Yew was sort of a, a philosopher king uh, run, running the country and running it with a pretty harsh hand uh, and, op and suppressing uh, opposition. Uh, and yet, he guided uh, uh, Singapore uh, to very successfully. And I found that really uh, quite distressing in a way uh, that, that, uh, that he could be as successful while suppressing uh, uh, alternative views, um, and I mean, even you look at China today, it's not an, it's very far from an open society, uh, but there is a kind of a social contract uh, where the people accept the authority of, of the rulers in order to have stability and, pro and, and economic progress. And the rulers know that they have to provide stability and economic progress in order to be the rulers. And, and actually, it, it's working very well as a, as a machine that is moving China forward, whereas America, which is a democracy, and you have freedom of, of, of all kinds of freedoms guaranteed, uh, basically uh, uh, half the, uh, the, the Congress is out to trip up the other half, and, and uh, uh, a tremendous amount of, is lost in the, in the adversarial uh, fighting. So, uh, I have to observe these things. I, they, they kind of don't fit into the conceptual framework uh, with which I'm, I'm, I'm still uh, operating. I'm modifying the conceptual framework. Uh, 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 but I have to recognize that democracy doesn't necess is not necessarily a superior form of social organization. It, it, it requires something more than democracy for that to be the case. And, and I've identified the pursuit of truth as that something more that has to be there. But it really means a set of values also where people are sufficiently public-minded um, to, to be concerned with the public good. I'll deal with that 
issue in the, in the, in the in the next lecture, actually, because I, I think that's a very important additional requirement uh, for an open society to, to be successful. Thank you very much. There was a question very early on, and I feel guilty that, yeah. And Thank you. Um, I would like to join on the debate about uh, manipulation in politics, and uh, I think the key word is consciousness. So, um, ideal voter in an ideal country would uh, listen to every political party speak, and uh, he would say that, uh, yeah, yes, he, he wanted to operate with my feelings, he, he, he just lied, or, or he just, uh, he just, he is not the man of this country. Um, so he, he would decide this, and he, he just wouldn't uh, vote on this party or on this man. And uh, my family has Sweden friends who said to me that uh, it is, it is, ex it is ex existing in uh, Sweden. So if a party would say to the Sweden people that we would lower the taxes if you would vote on us, then they would just laugh at them and they, it couldn't be a party. And uh, do you think that uh, Americans uh, don't have this type of consciousness or is it lack of the American society? The question, if I'm going to interpret it crudely, is do you believe that because the Americans are for lowering the taxes, they don't have a moral feeling? They have, don't, have moral. don't have a moral feeling. M moral? moral feeling or moral sentiment. Yes. I, I think that there is a very serious problem in America now with values. And I think uh, the, the, the market fundamentalism, uh, this uh, belief that the pursuit of self-interest somehow it has a moral uh, uh, support in the, this invisible hand of the market that assures that uh, people pursuing self-interest uh, get the be uh, reach the best allocation of resources. It's a it's a it's a false uh, interpretation of markets of society, and and it has become extremely. Uh, 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 powerful, because it happens to be very, suit, uh, very greatly beneficial to the owners and managers of capital. It's, it's a very satisfactory uh, uh, set of beliefs for them, and therefore they actually were willing to invest very serious amounts of money and effort to. Manipulate public opinion where it, it, it was it has been accepted as the truth, and and we just had the collapse of the financial markets, which ought to uh, bring about a serious questioning whether this set of uh, this ideology actually uh, is well founded or not. I am of course very much. Uh, a, a critic of it. Uh, I don't want to manipulate you, and I'm going to tell you the truth. We have three minutes, and there's at least seven or eight questions being there. So on this truthful note, I'll go to give uh, uh, Dan Stone the possibility to ask a question, and I do believe that the other questions after that uh, probably we can discuss outside of, outside of the room. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Diane Stone from the Department of Public Policy here at CEU. I've been struck this afternoon how much the discussion about politics has been very much focused on the nation state, talking about political parties, elections, the American political culture. So my question would be, to what extent is the notion of open society linked to the nation state as a society? or the degree to which open society can be delinked and associated with the ways in which society is forming in new forms uh, transnationally through the internet and various other kinds of um, associations, so regional association, for, ex for example, um, and the extent to which uh, open society could operate through things like Twitter, for example. 
Uh, and also, is this a domain where the threats and challenges to open society are perhaps greater than at the national level? The very last sentence was... The, the is this is where the challenge is uh, to yes, the open society? Yes. So no, I think it's an excellent question and, 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 and clearly um, the problems confronting humanity uh, transcend the national borders and because of uh, the uh, globalization of financial markets, etc., cetera, uh, actually the, the uh, financial markets have become global. The economy, of course, has become global, but the, uh, the uh, political system remains founded on the principle of sovereignty. And that has uh, uh, very serious, uh, creates very serious problems. Uh, and unless we solve that problem, uh, actually uh, the uh, global markets will disintegrate. But more than that, for instance, we are going to cook uh, because of global warming, because we will not be able to so solve that problem. It's not one that can be solved on a national uh, basis. So we, we actually have to make some very important steps forward in the form of uh, international governance to catch up with the globalization of, of, of our civilization. Thank you very much. I want to excuse myself for those who didn't manage to take the floor. There are going to be two more lectures, so you're going to have your opportunity. Thank you very much to our colleagues from New York. They had the first word, they didn't get the last one, but I do believe they're also going to get their chance. And Director. Well, I want to thank our audiences here in Budapest and in New York. Uh, I think through open discourse, we have explored the challenges uh, and opportunities of open society. Tomorrow, uh, these ideas will be explored even further when Mr. Soros looks at what he sees as a conflict between open society and economic fundamentalism. So, uh, be prepared to return and engage in further stimulating uh, conversation of the type we've had here today. For now, let me express gratitude to our expert moderator, Ivan Krushtev, and ask you once again to join me in thanking our extraordinary lecturer, George Soros. Thank you.